there's a danger in being in a church our size and that it is small enough that you can get to know people, but big enough that you don't know everybody. And so I don't know if this has happened to you ever before, but you start talking to somebody and you're not positive of their name. Are you transparent and vulnerable enough to say, listen, I don't remember your name? Or do you not want them to feel unimportant? So you go for it. I've done that. There was one gentleman who attended our church and I don't remember why I thought his name was Eric. But I'd say every Sunday, hey, Eric, how's it going, Eric? How are the kids, Eric? How's work? I saw him at a soccer game one time. What's up, Eric? About three years later, he pulled me aside. Pastor Scott, my name is not Eric. (laughs) Why did you wait so long? It was confusing to me, and I still don't know why it is that I thought his name was Eric. You ever get confused? Psychologists say there are multiple reasons why that happens to us. Sometimes it's memory loss. I've hit an age now where sometimes I'll be in a room and I'll be like, I'm not sure why I'm here. I'm not even positive how I got here. I'll be out in the garage at my house like, I don't know. Just go back inside, walk upstairs and go, oh, I needed a screwdriver. Back down the step. It's like, ever have that? They say another reason why we get confused is information overload. That's significant in our day and time where information is doubling every 12 hours. Ever go to Starbucks if you don't speak the language? I don't even know. You tell me what I want. I don't know. My wife will send me to the grocery store. She said beans. I didn't know there was a whole aisle. I have no idea what to do here. Information overload. Or sometimes you get into a situation that's not familiar to you, they say. When things are unfamiliar, it can become confusing. This week, I took one of our daughters. We've got four daughters, and several of them are teenagers. Oh, wait, all of them. Yikes. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll take the prayers. But I took one to the DMV, and we went to Oxford because we heard that there wasn't a wait there. When I got there, I knew why. No one can find it. (laughs) And so we pull up to the DMV. I text my wife. She's at work. And I said, yep, drop the other girls off at school. I didn't know Oxford was an hour drive from there, but we are here, and there's no one ahead of us because there's no one. And she said, what's Ava doing? I said, she's in talking to the lady right now, and then they're going to go do the road test. And then my wife said, I'm tearful. And the kind of husband I am, I thought I would spur her on in that. I believe the women in my house enjoy crying because they watch Lifetime movies. If you watch Lifetime movies, I assume you like to cry. And so I wanted to make my wife cry more. And so I said, well, I could tell she was nervous, but she wasn't doing some of the things that she would do when she was a little girl when she was nervous. And I mentioned those things to my wife and thought, for sure, she's welling up now. And then I said, it's not like she's not that little girl that I remember scored that first goal in soccer and I cheered for her. I said, bam. And she said, what? And then we had a moment. She's not the kid that was on my bed when I was going on a mission trip to Madagascar, and she's so little, she's only seen the cartoon, and she goes, have fun in the wild. (laughs) And the next thing I knew, there was this moisture on my face. I don't have emotions. What's happening? I was crying. It was unfamiliar to me. And that can be confusing. And it's easy to get confused today with all the information we have, with a divided country, with all the news, and you don't know what's fake news and what's real news and what's people just telling each other what they want to hear and what's a conspiracy theory and what's reality and what's being lied. Like, you don't know what's going on. It's confusing. I've got great news for you today as we look at this passage. Jesus Christ brings clarity in the midst of confusion. But the most dangerous thing that can happen is you're confused about him. And so I've titled today's message, Who is Jesus. The way we know is who he's told us he is and who he's proven he is through his actions. And so Luke chapter 24, we'll come to it. It's on that first Easter Sunday. But I want to remind you of something. As excited as you may have been coming to church to celebrate the resurrection, that's not how people were feeling the first Easter Sunday. And so I want you to try and enter into the text. And remember, this is a a dark day, not just because it's early in the morning before the sun rises, but there's darkness. It's like a dark night of the soul. They're grieving. Have you ever grieved? Psychologists say we go through cycles. Denial, anger, negotiation, even depression. That's part of our natural grieving process. Sometimes it's a loved one, like it was here with Jesus. Sometimes it's a dream. Life hasn't gone the way you wanted. Sometimes it's divorce. 
Sometimes it's just moving to a new house, losing a job, grief. And that's what they have. Because if you just know the Bible and you think about this with your head, you'd think, well, Jesus told them at least 10 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that he was going to die and rise from the dead. The Old Testament prophesies it. He directly said three times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priest, the elders, the teachers of the law. They're going to kill me. And after three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. You'd think they would sit there and go, day two, <laughs> tomorrow's going to be awesome. That's not what happens. Even that first morning in Luke chapter 24 at the beginning, the women are headed to the tomb not to find the stone rolled away, but to anoint a dead body. And when the stones rolled away, by the way, that's not so Jesus could get out, it's so that we could get in. They're amazed and they begin mourning. And look at what it says. I'll read, um, let's see. In their fright, the women bowed down their face to the ground. And there's these two angels that appeared to them. It's in darkness. Their clothes are like lightning. There's a contrast there. Verse 5, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Mm -hmm. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, raised again. Then they remember. Really? They took that? Yeah. Well, then they go back and they tell the other disciples. Now, see, it's easy for us. Like, we'll read the story. It's hard to remember the darkness. Have you ever watched a sporting event where you know your team wins? And you'll watch it. NC State fans are like, I'm going to be watching the whole tournament. This is going to be awesome. It's like 1986. Was it 86? 86? I wasn't here then. 83? I'm sorry. I, wasn't I try to be offensive sometimes to sports teams. I wasn't trying there. Um, you go back and you watch those games, and you, it doesn't matter if, if things look bad. It doesn't matter if there's a technical foul, the coach gets ejected, your star player gets injured. You're like, somehow we win because you know the ending. And that's how we sometimes come, but remember, they're living this. And so enter in, and you see what happens here. In verse 9, it says, when they came back from the tomb, these women, they told all these things to the 11. Remember, Judas isn't there. So not only has Jesus been crucified, one of their friends has committed suicide, Judas. And all the others. It was Mary Magdalene. Oh, we don't have time today, but that's significant. If you have shame, research who that is. Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women. Wait, Jesus said it. Now they're testifying to it. And look what it says. Because their words seemed to them like nonsense. That's not normal, unfamiliar. They're confused. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. John tells us that he went with them as well. And John, in his account, also tells us he got there first. So he's faster than Peter. Everyone will know that forever. And so, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to him, not going, ah, now I remember. He's still confused, wondering to himself what had happened. So he said, nonsense, wondering, they're grieving. And this news is either so bad, it's unbelievable, like when you saw planes fly into towers on 9-11, or so good, it's too good to be true. You've got an uncle who's going to give you a billion dollars. Ed McMahon's going to show up with a check. Unbelievable. In Luke's account of the resurrection, no one has seen the resurrected Christ yet, and we find these two guys that are not popular. One goes unnamed forever. Verse 13. Now the same day, so it's Easter morning still, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So all this is happening, and they're not going, not like Peter, not like John. Why are Peter and John the only ones that run to the tomb? I don't know if they get enough credit for this. These guys are walking seven miles in the wrong direction. It's what happens when we drift from Jesus. They're isolating themselves from the gathering of believers. They can't even fathom a version of Jesus that would voluntarily let himself be arrested. They wanted a military Messiah. Look at what happens. 
They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. That's significant. We'll come back to that. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Isn't it interesting that the one person on the whole planet that has all the answers asks a lot of questions? He knows the answer, what they're talking about, but he's getting to their hearts. They stood still, their faces downcast, so we know they're not celebrating. They might be depressed. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you clueless Jesus? (laughs) It's my paraphrase, but look at how he says it. (laughs) Jesus had gone viral. That's all anybody was talking about in Jerusalem. But he says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Jesus, what things? (laughs) He's the one who was dead for three days. Just remember that. But they don't know that. He asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And then look what they say. Notice the tense. Not present tense. He was a prophet. Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. And Jesus didn't say, you mean exactly like he told you they would? Well, he's just quiet. He lets them talk. Lets them go. Just letting the line run here for a little while. We had hoped, you might underline that if you mark in your Bible, that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They mean by that, that he'd be our political leader, that he would free us from Roman oppression. That's what most of his disciples believed. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, here's a footnote, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. And Jesus didn't say, because I'm right here. There's a reason why. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, I would have asked another question. Why didn't you go? Where are you going? He doesn't do that. But here you've got these Guys, and it appears the reason why they're confused is because their expectation hasn't met their experience. Have you ever had that? Someone hands you what you think is a cup of coffee. It was actually soy sauce. Oh, man. You go on a vacation, and the website was the prettiest sunset, and the pool was amazing, and they super saturated pictures with filters, and you get there, and the pool's empty for maintenance, and it's raining the whole time. Your experience and your expectations... And they don't line up, oftentimes disappointing, frustrating, but sometimes even confusing. And for these men, it was about Jesus. And that's dangerous. It's one thing to overspend a vacation because you got duped on a website. It's another thing to have a sour taste when you thought there'd be a sweet taste. But when you are wrong about Jesus, the consequences are eternal. And there is a lot of confusion about Jesus in our world. Just think about all the different versions of Jesus that are out there. Every agenda in any kind of Christianized area will attach their agenda to Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left. And one, it sounds like I have a a news station uh, that I'll watch on my, I use YouTube TV and they've got a multi-view option. And when I watch the news, it's got Fox News and CNN News MSNBC, and BBC. Usually I just let it play in the background, but every once in a while, like when a bridge in Baltimore goes down, uh, all of them talk about the same thing. When that happens, I look. He's, everyone in Jerusalem is talking about this one thing, about this Jesus, and do you see what's happening, the problem in their hearts? They were confused about Jesus. They didn't expect him to die. He said he would, but their expectations, their experience were not, they wanted a military leader. They had hoped Hollow hope leads to empty hearts. They're wrong about Jesus. Sometimes CNN will talk about Jesus, and they'll talk about how he cared about the marginalized. That's true. And then they use this nebulous version of love that people are talking about him on there that has no morality. It doesn't matter who you sleep with, but Jesus is love. Just love every. It's like, that's not the version of Jesus we read in the Bible. Because he cares about you, he wants you to experience the life he has for you. And that's not you deciding your own way. 
You watch another channel, Fox sometimes, they'll have people that are on there, and it's like you picture Jesus with a gun in one hand and a Bible in the other and capitalism in his heart. It's like, I don't see. I don't think they had guns in the, did they, a musket? No, no musket. Huh. I mean, in Israel last year, and they had these posters that said, Moses and guns. And I'm like, he had a staff. I'm not against guns, but that's weird. <laughs> and so we get these slight variations, a lot of times towards our preferences. And I heard another pastor give an illustration one time where he talked about if you're building something and you have two two-by-fours, and you cut one, and the other one's supposed to be the same length, but you're off by an eighth of an inch, it's no big deal. But if you have a thousand two-by-fours, and you're off by an eighth of an inch on every cut, the thousands two by four doesn't look anything like the original. And that's what's happened for many of us with Jesus, whether it's genie Jesus or bracelet Jesus or Christian contemporary music Jesus or your hero, like a Jason Bourne supernatural version of Jesus, like whatever it is, if you get it wrong, he says this is going to happen to a lot of people. Matthew chapter 7, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and I will say, Depart from me. I never knew you. You can't get this one wrong. The consequences are too big. There's too much to say about who he is to do it in one service. But from this passage, I want to give you four things you can expect from Jesus, and your experience will line up. The first one is this, that Jesus is personal. Jesus is incredibly personal. He knows the hairs on your head, and if you don't have any, he knows that too. He knows your thoughts before you think them, which can be a little scary. But he knows everything that these men have going on in their hearts, and notice he doesn't run up to them and say, hey, you're going the wrong way. All the action's back here. He doesn't just walk up and say, see the scars? The lumen are right. What are you doing? Why are you so discouraged? I told you this was going to... He doesn't condemn their doubt. He enters in. And if you want to know that Jesus is personal more than just from this passage, the whole Bible, when he comes to earth, the Christmas story, he leaves heaven where we read about in Revelation. There's no crying, no pain, no darkness, no sin, no death. And he enters in here where there is sin and there is death. So he leaves this place where there's no more and he comes to a place that's broken to the core. But instead of just snapping his fingers and taking these men out of their hopelessness, he enters into their hopelessness. We had hoped. He doesn't go, yeah, I know. Because your hope was wrong. He lets them talk. Enters in. Mary and Martha, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus wouldn't have died. Jesus knows, and he's the only one who knows what he's about to do. We'll sing about it when we celebrate baptisms. But he's going to call Lazarus, come out of that tomb. But he lets them grieve. And John 11, 35, he weeps. He weeps with those who weep. He mourns with those who mourn. He knows what it's like to be tempted in every way as you're tempted. And he enters in to your sin and shame like the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Doesn't condone it, but doesn't condemn her. Interesting. Does your Jesus, is there even a a version where that's possible? That you don't just take sides and so this or that and he enters in, not condoning, not condemning. Enters into shame. How about the woman at the well? How about Peter? He's denied Jesus three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? That's why Jesus asked Peter three times and then he says afterwards, I still have a plan for your life. Not Man, you're so bad. And for these men, he enters into their hopelessness. And he doesn't even condemn their hopelessness. He lets them talk. Hmm. Is it any wonder why the first time God's given a name by anyone in the Bible, Hagar, a woman who's been abused by Abraham, the father of our faith. And she says, you are the God who sees. He sees you. He's personal. It's one thing to be personal. He's also powerful. You can expect him to be powerful. See, I can enter into your pain too. I can carry a burden with you, but I can't fix it. I can't change your heart. I can't make your hope shift. I can't do much of anything. I'm pretty limited. I'm what theologians would call finite, but 
God's infinite. And you look and you see what Jesus does here. Remember I said it's significant that they were unable to recognize them. It said, uh, what is it, verse 15, as they talked, they discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up to them, walked along with them, verse 16. But they were kept from recognizing him. (laughs) The word kept there, some of your Bibles say prevented, is the word for power, strength. We don't know how he did it. Theologians speculate. I've tried to speculate. I thought, was it like a Scooby-Doo episode where he was wearing a mask the whole time and then at the end of the passage and they're like, it was you the whole time. Probably not going to make any scholarly journals, but that's my contribution. (laughs) Jedi mind trick, you do not see me, but you do see me. I don't know. He has power. And they can't see that it's him. And I think that's for their benefit and yours. Because what he does to demonstrate that power is he reveals himself as the great door opener. He opens the door of understanding. He opens the revelation of who he is with the Bible, not with nail-scarred hands. He opens the scriptures. And it says he opens their eyes. Have you ever seen there are YouTube videos out there about people who were blind and they couldn't see and now they can see? I watched one last night. A guy named Mr. Beast. If you don't know who he is, your kids do. And I don't know, I don't know all the details of it, I just watched it last night, so I didn't even have time to research it, but there was this cataract surgery that takes about 10 minutes, and they said half the blind people in the world, all they need is a 10 minute surgery, and they'd be able to see. But they can't afford it, they don't know, there's various reasons why, and so on his YouTube channel, which had 247 million views of this one video last year, they paid for the surgery for a thousand people. It goes all over the world. Here in the United States, Mexico, China, like all different places that he goes to, Africa, all these different spots, and he's paying to have their surgeries. And there was one guy, he was a father, and he became blind 12 years earlier, hadn't seen his teenage son in 12 years. And Mr. Beast asked him, what are you most excited to see? He said, my son, can you imagine not seeing your kid grow up? And then somebody comes along and says, I can make it so you can see him. People were crying, not me, not me, but people were crying. There was one young man, Satchel was his name. He was born with bad eyesight and a defect, but then he got in a go-kart accident and totally lost his vision. And he said, what do you you want to see? He goes, I want to be able to drive. He gave him a Tesla at the end of the video. Yeah. One in a thousand people in the Mr. Beast video got a Tesla. Jesus will open your eyes so you can have eternal joy at his right hand starting now and for all of eternity. And you look what he does with these men. How did he open their eyes? First of all, he says to them, are you so foolish? Which you might think to yourself, well, Jesus was being so kind. Now all of a sudden he's letting them talk. He's calling them idiots. No, no. There is a word for moron or idiot in the Bible. Moro, that's where we get our word, moron. That's not the word that's used here when he says foolish. He said to them, how foolish you are. It means slow to learn. Dull. Some of your translations say, oh, how foolish. Because the original language actually implies that Jesus has strong emotions here. But it doesn't seem, because of the choice of word and the situation, that Jesus is going, you idiots. It seems like he's going, oh. How did you not know this already? And look at what he does. How slow to believe all the... Remember, they said that he was a prophet. Look at what he says. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All is the key word there. Because they believe some of what the prophets had spoken. They probably believed, Micah 5, 2, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, like Jesus. Isaiah 7, 14, that he'd be born of a virgin, like Jesus. But somehow they missed Isaiah 53, that he'd be beaten beyond the recognition of a human. Maybe that's why they didn't recognize him. That he'd be crushed for our iniquities. Oh, they believed that the government would be on his shoulders. But did they believe the crucifixion would take place? The resurrection would take place? Because they're all talked about in the Old Testament. All the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, 
Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. And scholars will say, he probably went to Genesis 3.15. That's the first prophecy of the Messiah. The seed will come. He'll crush the head of the serpent. He probably mentioned it, but look at what it says. It tells us which scripture's here. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I don't know how long a seven-mile walk takes, but longer than any sermon I've ever preached. And they didn't, they still didn't know it was Jesus. But he starts to open their understanding by showing them their misunderstanding, to open revelation about himself, and this should be comforting to you because some skeptics will say, well, yeah, if I saw the resurrected Christ with nail-scarred hands, able to pass through walls, but also eating food, I'd believe too. That's not what he used to open their minds and their eyes. He used the scriptures, which we have, and clearly proclaimed him. But the problem was, it appears they were taking what they liked and leaving what they didn't. And so they had deduced in their mind that Jesus would be a military leader. Uh, what did they do with Psalm twenty-two, sixteen? Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Hmm, sounds like the crucifixion to me. Resurrection? Psalm 16, I've already mentioned it. Peter uses it on the day of Pentecost when he talks about the resurrection of Christ. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. Doesn't mean you won't die, but you won't be there long enough to decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. There will be a resurrection. I already mentioned Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, 9, it says this, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich. Wait a minute. When Rome crucified people, they let their bodies burn in a valley called Gehenna. But Jesus is buried in a rich man's tomb, Matthew 27. A guy named Joseph of Arimathea gives his new tomb, a rich man. That's important. It says he's a rich man from Arimathea. I've had skeptics that have attended our church before and told me the only reason Jesus fulfilled the prophecies is because he knew them ahead of time and then lived his life accordingly. How powerful do you have to be to be born of a virgin and then in your tomb have a rich man decide to donate it because a prophecy 700 years before you walked the earth was written? Only God. He is personal. He is powerful. He is preeminent. Preeminent means there's no one like him. He is alone. Buddha, and raised from the dead. Muhammad, not raised from the dead. A lot of religions are just codes that are not even built around a personality. Ours is built around a personality. And sometimes you'll hear people say, well, if a A movement's built around a personality. It's a cult. Or it's Jesus Christ. But if the version of Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible, it's a cult. You may like it, but hollow hope leaves empty hearts. But when your hope is in the preeminent Christ, based on the promises of Jesus, it's eternal satisfaction. That's Psalm 1611. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. They begin now, and they go forever. He's preeminent because, as John Piper says when he's talking about Jesus being personal, he says this, Jesus can go where no one else can go. He can go where no counselor can go, where no doctor can go, where no lover can go. He can reach you and reach into you Anywhere and anytime, there's no place where you are and no depths of your personhood that you are which Jesus can't penetrate. So Jesus open. are you open that maybe you've been wrong about Jesus and that he wants to do something in your heart today? Jesus' resurrection from the dead equips him, fits him, makes him able to do what no one else can do. And he does it using the Bible. Interesting, Uh, one gentleman, uh, Ray Pritchard, says this. He rebukes them for one thing and one thing only, for failing to understand and apply the Scriptures. He doesn't upbraid them for leaving Jerusalem and walking back home. He doesn't criticize their doubt nor condemn their confusion. All that was perfectly understandable given the circumstances. 
and the fragmented inf fragmentary information they had. But he tells them they should have known and believed what God said. Jesus is the only one who's been born of a virgin, miraculous womb, risen from the dead. He is risen. A miraculous tomb. And he is risen from the dead so that you can have resurrection life. We're going to see some people be baptized in just a few moments. They'll be dunked under the water, which is a picture of death, and then raised up out of the water, a picture of resurrection, because they've placed their faith in Jesus Christ, and they want to proclaim to you and to the world that they're following him in a new way of life, and that's available to you because Jesus is not only preeminent, Jesus is present. It's interesting what happens next in our passage, and we've run out of time, and the children's ministry will kill me if I go over today, so... Jesus pretends. It's pretty amazing. They're walking along. They still don't know who he is. And he walks like he's going to keep going. And they don't know it's Jesus, but they say, come with us, come with us. They invite him in. And then, and only then, do they realize who he is. You've got to invite him. Jesus is the Savior of the world. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. Our advocate, he asks a lot of questions. Some people come into relationships making accusations. There's somebody called the accuser in the Bible. You don't want to be associated with him. He's our advocate, our almighty God, our high priest. He is personal. He is powerful. He is preeminent. And he is present. He's omnipresent because he's God. But for you to experience him, you must invite him in. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. You talk about he's preeminent. There's no one like him. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, there is no other name by which you can be saved but the name Jesus. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You might say, well, not my Jesus. Well, then your Jesus didn't die for you. And your Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And your Jesus is not going to get you into heaven. Because the real Jesus did say that. The Bible also says in Romans 10, Verses 9 and 10, if you want to know that I'm not making it up, we'll put it on the screen. You can peek. It says, if you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, in your heart, you believe that. And you confess with your mouth that you surrender your life to him. Call him Lord is the way the Bible says that. Then you'll be saved, rescued from your sin. But you've got to invite him in. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. If you need to place your faith in Jesus and have real hope, Circumstances didn't change in this story. What their hearts and their hope did as Jesus opened their eyes to who he truly is. And do you know what they did next? They returned. They turned. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. They turned and they went back to Jerusalem to be with the believers, to be part of this movement. Their purpose was restored. Their life had meaning. And some of you need to turn to that and receive the forgiveness of Jesus. Turn your life over to him and he will direct you acknowledge your sin. Ask him to forgive you and ask him to be your savior. You can pray a prayer that goes like this. You don't have to say, these words aren't magical, but you can just pray, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I believe that your son Jesus is the savior of the world and I want him to be my savior. I invite Jesus into my heart, into my life right now. And I surrender my life to him. Maybe you even call him Lord. He's your Lord. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, but is he your Lord? Some of you need to return to Jesus. You've drifted for whatever reason and whatever way, and maybe people don't even know, and maybe outwardly no one would even be able to tell, or maybe you have, and maybe you're ashamed and you're scared and whatever. He knows. If you've gone back to an old way of life like Peter did, he will restore you. And he'll make the years ahead better than the years behind. He'll change you. Turn back to him. Give him your heart. If today you hear his voice, do not be like the Israelites in the wilderness and harden your hearts. Respond to what he's saying to you. He is having a thousand conversations in this moment. And Jesus, thank you for being personal, knowing the details, the disappointments, the angers, the frustrations, the doubts. Like John the Baptist, some of us came even wondering, is he really who he said he is? And like you told him, look at what you're doing. You're doing everything you said you would do. Not a bunch of stuff people want you to do, 
But you didn't promise that stuff. What you promised, you do. And when we hope in you and what you promised in your word, our hope is fulfilled. Father, will you keep being you, but open our eyes to see it and experience it. It's in Jesus' name I pray.